Hello, my name is Eric Westis, and I'm here today to talk a little bit about mosquitoes and the important diseases that they carry. I became interested in mosquitoes and, and sort of their epidemiology and ecology as a graduate student at St. Louis University. And while I'm not going to talk specifically today about my dissertation research, I will share a little bit of what I've learned over the years about these important disease vectors. I want to start with a quote, my favorite quote from Aldo Leopold, and I like it because it reiterates to me that no matter how sort of protected and insulated we feel from Mother Nature, we are still so intimately connected to the ecosystems around us. And nowhere is that more apparent than the sort of host vector disease relationships that are really written into our very DNA. So think of the well-known example of the human sickle cell trait. Um, in its, in its homozygous form, when it's inherited from both the mother and the father, it can be deadly. But in its heterozygous form, when it's inherited from just one parent, it actually uh, confers a degree of resistance to malaria. And this is why it's persisted in our collective gene pool uh, over the millennia. So people living in these warm, wet climates are undoubtedly familiar with mosquitoes, the diseases that they carry, and the dangers that they pose. But those of us who are sort of in the more temperate regions, uh, we periodically need to be reminded of this. And insurance and healthcare professionals in particular should understand the risks that these diseases and these vectors compose uh, when working in these areas or when thinking about emerging diseases that may be uh, arriving on our shores shortly. So everything in biology and ecology starts with understanding your critter. Uh, so let's take a look at the mosquito. Uh, it's, the mosquitoes are in a family of fly. They're actually a type of fly, and we call them culicity. And the last time I checked, uh, there were 43 different genre of mosquitoes and about 3,500 different species that occur worldwide. Now, three of those genera are important disease vectors, the Anopheles mosquitoes, the Aedes mosquitoes, and the Culex mosquitoes. And uh, if you look at this picture on the right over here, uh, you can see that the segmented body that is characteristic of our, all arthropods uh, you can see uh, six legs, characteristic of insects, and while it looks like this critter has two wings, it actually has four, which is another characteristic of, of, of insects. Uh, the mosquitoes, they're two, are actually all flies. The two front wings are the flight wings, and the two rear wings are these tiny little vestigial organs that are used for stabilization. And then that long proboscis in the front is what it uses to drink either blood or nectar. And so we're, we're really looking at three different genres today. The Anopheles mosquitoes are the ones that are responsible for transmitting malaria. And there are members of this genus all over the world. Uh, what makes them dangerous, is, again, is they, they transmit uh, malaria and they roost indoors. And so they can feed on us while we sleep. Uh, and one of the ways to identify these critters is look at the, the feeding posture. So you can see this guy, um, or actually this, this girl, because it's always the females that drink that drink blood, uh, the, um, the feeding posture is the abdomen is sticking straight up in the air. So this is sort of characteristic of Anopheles mosquitoes. So the Aedes mosquitoes were once endemic to uh, Africa and Southeast Asia, but uh, Aedes aegypti uh, has since moved to tropics uh, in South, Central and South America and other parts of the world, and Aedes albopictus has moved to other parts of North America and I believe Europe. And then finally on the right, we have the Culex mosquitoes, and these guys are active mostly during dusk. Uh, and their they transmit uh, West Nile virus uh, and a host of other, other arboviruses. And again, these things are, are worldwide. So all mosquitoes are going to exhibit a four-stage life cycle, and I've actually split the last stage into two parts, which I'll talk about in a second. But eggs are laid, uh, several hundred eggs are laid on the surface of the water or on moist soil. And after a couple of days, uh, those eggs will emerge into larvae, which will swim around and they will eat um, different microorganisms and plant matter that's in the water. And they'll breathe at the surface of the water through these little, uh, little snorkels. Uh, and that's why they need, they need stagnant water. So a, a good way to get rid of mosquitoes is to put a, put a little fountain in your pond uh, or to somehow agitate the water surface. Um, after a couple of days to weeks, they will turn into pupae, where they will metamorphosize into the adult mosquitoes, who will then emerge. And 
pathogens are generally not transferred from mother to egg, so the emerging adult mosquito are not yet infectious. Only, and only the female mosquitoes, like I said, are going to be the ones that bite. They, the females require blood to provide nutrients to their, uh, for egg production. Okay, so, so we have these adult mosquitoes that are, that are susceptible, and if uh, one of these females uh, encounters an infectious host, then she will become infectious herself, and, uh, and then on the, her next blood meal, because they can reproduce several times, she may pass that pathogen back to a new host. Uh, and this cycle repeats, uh, can, can repeat every, every couple of weeks. Now let's turn our attention to uh, some of the diseases that the mosquitoes carry. Malaria is responsible for half a million deaths each year. And it's not a bacteria or a virus, it's actually a protozoan a, uh, of the genus Plasmodium. And there are five different species that we need to be concerned about, the falciporum, the vivax, ovale, malariae, and no lessi. The plasmodium sporocytes make their way into a susceptible human's bloodstreams, uh, where he or she is fed upon by an infected female, Anopheles mosquito. Uh, and then those sporocytes travel to the liver where they replicate inside the liver cells. And then those cells eventually rupture, releasing merozoites, which make their way into the bloodstream and they infect the blood cells, and they start to replicate in the blood cells, and every two or three days, they finish growing and they rupture again, releasing more merozoites into the bloodstream. And like I said, this cycle repeats every couple of days, uh, it, causing sort of these paroxysm of fever that is characteristic of malaria. Now, a few of those merozoites will differentiate into the male and female forms, and these are the forms that actually uh, get passed back to the mosquito where they fertilize uh, and grow into oocytes, which then um, convert back into the sporozoites, which then infect the next host. So this cycle, the, the, the sort of, um, the cycle occurs in two different hosts and the, the, the non-sexual, the asexual reproduction phase occurs in the humans while the sexual reproduction phase occurs in the mosquito. This disease is endemic to the tropics and the subtropics. The World Health Organization estimates that there are approximately 200 million cases of malaria every year and, in, and disease across the world, uh, specifically in the, in the tropics and subtropical regions. And the classic symptoms are that reoccurring fever that lasts about six to eight hours and it's going to reoccur every, every couple of days depending on the species. The complicated malaria which uh, is the result of one particular species of malaria, uh, the falciporum. And this one is substantially more dangerous than the other forms because it causes the infected blood cells to start to clot and it can block blood flow to the vital organs. Now the symptoms of that are gonna vary depending on the organ that's being starved of blood, but it can very quickly turn, turn fatal if it's a vital organ. Two species, the vivax and the ovali, are capable of developing hypnozoites, which can then lay dormant in the liver uh, for, for years before they start to reproduce. So you can, you can go for years without seeing any symptoms and not being bit before you develop uh, malaria if you're bit by these, or if you get infected by these, uh, these two species. So different chemoprophylaxis can be used by travelers to prevent infection. Uh, and what that does is it prevents the sporozoites from, from infecting the liver. Uh, once you become infected, some different treatments can be uh, used to kill the merozoites, but always prevention is sort of the best medicine, and so people that are living in these areas tend to use insecticide sprays and, and, and uh, repellents, and especially bed nets and other things that will separate them from the mosquitoes. Okay, now let's turn our attention to a collection of viruses that have sort of made headlines in recent years as they've turned up in unexpected places. So arboviruses are viruses that are transmitted by an arthropod vector. Uh, and the ones that we're gonna be concerned with today are in the genre flavivirus and alphavirus. And so some of these viruses can cause infections that are really mild or asymptomatic, but then others can be very painful or even life-threatening. They historically occur in the tropics and subtropics but in recent uh, decades they have followed their vectors into more temperate climates. And so since there's no widely approved vaccinations for these things, uh, nor are there any uh, real specific antivirals, the best defense against these is just effective pest control. 
Um, and there are a lot of these different viruses, and I'm going to talk about five different ones today. The first one is dengue fever, and its nickname is called breakbone fever, and that's because it causes really horrific joint and muscle pain. Uh, and there are actually four different types of this virus. Um, all of them are transmitted by the Aedes aegypti mosquitoes. Um, and a few can be transmitted by Aedes albopictus. Um, but primarily we think of aegypti as the, as the main vector for these things. Uh, dengue is an infection that's often mild at first, at, the, at least the first infection. Uh, but if you get one of the other serotypes later on, that can turn very painful and debilitating. In extreme cases, it can cause hemorrhaging of cap capillary tissue uh, and can be potentially fatal. It has about a 1% mortality rate when it's treated, but if left untreated, that, that mortality rate can go up to 20%. Uh, and there's no specific antiviral, so care providers really just attend to the, the symptoms. Uh, I did read that a vaccine has been available in Mexico since 2015, but I honestly, I don't know as, as much about that. That was, that was new to me. Now Zika, our next arbovirus, made its way into the public consciousness uh, a couple years ago when there was a, 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 an unexpected outbreak in South and Central America. And that outbreak was linked to some really severe birth defects. And this virus is closely related to dengue. Uh, it's actually named for the Zika forest in Uganda where it was first described. Uh, like dengue, it, it sort of followed its primary vector, which is again Aedes aegypti. And, uh, it's followed Aedes aegypti out of Africa uh, to the areas that, that this is invaded. And the symptoms of this one uh, are, are really mild. You might not even know that you are sick, but if a woman is pregnant, uh, when she gets this disease, the virus can uh, cause severe birth defects, uh, the microcephaly that made headlines, and that is a lifelong debilitating uh, condition. Again, there's no specific antivirus for this. There's no uh, vaccine. Uh, so the, the best course of treatment is, is really just to address the symptoms. West Nile virus was the one that made headlines uh, at the turn of the millennia when it spread across North America over the course of several years. Uh, it's also a member of the flavor virus genre, uh, same as dengue and Zika. Uh, this one, however, is not transmitted by Aedes. It's uh, transmitted by the Culex mosquitoes. And unlike those other two, uh, birds are the primary reservoir for this disease, and humans are a dead end as far as it's concerned. And I remember uh, this disease really did a number on the, the bird population of North America when it hit. And I remember crows being particularly uh, hard to spot uh, for a few years until their population recovered. Now, most human cases of this are asymptomatic, uh, and, and you won't really um, know that you have it, or you might feel like a mild flu. Uh, but a few cases uh, may develop uh, encephalitis or meningitis. Uh, and this, this picture on the right here is actually of a, of a trap, uh, a mosquito trap that I took a photo of that I found in the park near our house. Uh, and these traps are set up uh, by state and local governments to monitor the virus population or the virus load in the mosquito populations to keep track of whether or not to uh, expect a, an outbreak. And finally, our last one is chikungunya. This is an alpha virus. It's not the flavor virus that the other three are. This is a different type of, of virus. Uh, but it is also transmitted by Aedes aegypti. Uh, it was endemic to Africa, and it got its name from a Kimikande word that means to become contorted, because like dengue, it can cause really severe joint and muscle pain. The scary thing about this one is that uh, that pain can become chronic and can last for several years. And like all of the viruses, arboviruses, there's no specific antiviral for this one, uh, and nor is there a vaccine. And the good news about this one, though, is that people that get it generally uh, develop an immunity to it uh, for subsequent exposures. Let's talk a minute about mosquito control. Uh, there's, there's not a lot of, of, of antivirals or specific things that you can do for infections. And so when we talk about these viruses, mostly what we're talking about is controlling the mosquito population. And most people know about pesticides and bed nets and draining standing water, but all those have sort of limited success. And pesticides in particular um, have to be reapplied all the time. 
and they can have devastating consequences for other insects and other bugs that are beneficial like our, like our uh, pollinators, our bees, that are so uh, important as, uh, uh, for, our, for our fruit production. So, um, so there's been a lot of money and a lot of time invested in finding alternative methods for controlling these things. Um, one approach has been to release uh, large numbers of sterile males. And well, I said that the, the, the female mosquitoes were the ones that do all of the transmission. If you release a lot of males into the population, they sort of overwhelm the females and they, the females can't find suitable mates. And so what happens is the, the females spend all of their time uh, occupied with these sterile males and they can't uh, reproduce effectively and the population crashes. Uh, the good thing about that is it's, it's really safe. There's no pesticides that are used. The downside is like pesticides, uh, you, you need to continue to do this every once in a while as the, as the population bounces back. So a more permanent solution, uh, which is being tried now, is the use of a, a special bacteria called Wolbachia. The interesting thing about this Wolbachia bacteria is that it is, it is found in a lot of different types of, of insects. So it's known to be safe. It doesn't really have any, any adverse effects towards humans or the, the larger you know, ecology in general, because it's already out there everywhere. But for some reason, it's generally not found in mosquitoes. And so if we infect mosquitoes with this bacteria artificially and release those mosquitoes back into the wild, a, a couple of things happen. The mosquitoes that are infected with this bacteria have a hard time transmitting the arboviruses, and so they are not competent vectors at that point. And the second thing is that this bacteria is transmitted from, from the female mosquito to the eggs, and so it, it, the bacteria is sort of inherited from the mother. So, um, once it's established in the population, it's going to stay there. And then the last thing, which is really interesting, is that this bacteria has a, 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 a puts a selection pressure on the on the population, meaning that these the individuals that are infected with this bacteria reproduce uh, better than the they outreproduce the uninfected uh, mosquitoes. And so very quickly, the entire population could become infected with this Wolbachia bacteria and unable to, transmit the, um, unable to transmit the viruses. So that uh, becomes then a permanent self-sustaining uh, solution to eradicating these diseases. Okay, so in closing, uh, I really want you to take away uh, uh, four things from, from uh, this video. The first is that the Anopheles mosquitoes in the, uh, are the ones that trans transmit malaria while AEDs and Culex are responsible for transmitting the arboviruses about which we're concerned. Um, secondly, malaria continues to be a substantial cause of sickness and death uh, in the tropics and subtropical areas, and insurers should consider this when working in those climates. Um, third thing is that arboviruses like dengue and Zika and West Nile uh, can be painful and debilitating um, diseases, and they're spreading as their vector um, mosquitoes, the Aedes aegypti, moves out of, moves out of the um, tropics. And then finally, that, that um, insurers might want to consider contributing to the development of these biological control measures that have the potential to provide real cost-effective and sustainable relief to some of these diseases. So thank you for listening. Uh, put on your bug spray and, and go clean out your gutters to, to keep these mosquitoes at bay. Thank you. <laughs>